Well, last week I introduced you to a new hero, the Texas Demon Hunter. We got the first chance to observe his techniques and follow him through this crazy state. This week, the adventures continue through the West Texas town of El Paso, near the New Mexico state line and on the Mexican border. What dangers will he face this time? Well, you're just going to have to stick around and listen to find out. Another fantastic story from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. So, once again, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I logged off of the computer and called the number on the business card he'd given me over three years ago. The phone rang twice. Pedro's ice house. Ricky speaking. The voice on the other line responded. Hey bro, it's Max. I responded. Well, if it isn't my old friend Maxwell. Hey, you know, you still owe me ten bucks. He cheerfully replied. I know, I know. Look, I'll pay you back, dude. I said while smiling into the phone. You know I'm just giving you a hard time. It is my job, you know, he said. I don't get to see you very often, and I have to get my jabs in wherever I can, he cheerfully added. So, what's up, man? On a mission? He asked over a cacophony of bar traffic noises in the background. You know it. Look, can I come tomorrow morning, say, around 9am? I asked. 9 a.m.? Damn, why so freaking early? He asked. I need to get an early start. Driving to El Paso tomorrow. Yeah, I'll be there. And you will bring breakfast, he said. Okay, you got it. See you then, I answered. And then hung up. Ricky was my equipment contact. He supplied me with any tactical equipment that I needed for any mission anywhere. There was nothing he did not have, or at least couldn't get hold of in a day or two. Our friendship had blossomed over the last few years. He was always there for me, just like a brother that I'd never had. There were times when I needed items to assist me during events in different terrain, weather or location. Ricky and Aggie were my suppliers for everything demon-related, so to speak. I was going to need some desert survival equipment for this mission. This mission was one of those border missions that often occurred due to a strong occult presence along and sometimes across the border. The West Texas town of El Paso was near the New Mexico state line and on the Mexican border. Just on the other side of the border was the Mexican town of Juarez. It was your typical Mexican border town, full of shops, stands and carts of vendors selling their wares to eager and gullible tourists. There was a disturbance occurring in Juarez that was leading to the deaths of three men and five missing tourists. The tourists were a bunch of younger guys that were in search of adventure. Unfortunately, this sort of thing happens all the time in these towns. The thing that made this a case worthy of my involvement were the reports of an entity that was all too familiar to me. It was what they called Diablo del Desierto, which stood for the Devil of the Desert. Word tends to spread quickly in these situations, even in these towns of relatively low income. Cell phones were becoming easier and easier to obtain, even in the low income parts of these towns. Legends and superstitions abound as well. Many people are skeptical of these superstitions, but I personally know all too well that there is truth to many of these situations. I was most likely looking for Zorvitz. These were demons that tended to be fairly large in size, around 7 to 9 feet tall. They usually had the appearance of a huge bipedal ogre-like being. They have a deep red appearance with two large ram-like horns with all black eyes and no pupils. They have a wild boar-like nose and tusks about 6 inches long. They're muscular and fairly conventional in appearance, at least as far as what people think of when they see a demon. Many demons have a very bizarre corporeal appearance, but not this one. Their advantages are that they are very strong and able to throw things as large as a car, up to seven to eight feet. 
They can also breathe fire, almost always on command. Like most demons, they were immune to any type of fire and heat. They were fairly intelligent, and have a penchant for capturing and torturing their captors. On the demon power scale, they were about a five. They were often summoned for murderous or vengeful purposes, like many of them are. Their weaknesses were the cold. They could often be defeated by cold tactics. They have poor eyesight as well. Hand-to-hand -hand combat with these things was strongly ill-advised due to their thick hides. Brute force, however, was the best way to banish them. I composed a list for this mission, using what I knew about these things. I jumped into my custom Thor Bronco and headed over to Ricky's place with my list in pocket. What you need is a case of these babies, Ricky said. They can fit into your favorite gun too, he added with a devious smile. He showed me a case of six bullets with liquid nitrogen core. Upon impact on a target, they would not only produce a wound, but they would also freeze up to six inches in diameter upon impact. There was a capsule that exploded upon hitting a target that would release the nitrogen and pack quite a punch as well. Hey, how many of these do you have? I asked him. Only one case of six, dude, so you'll have to use them wisely, he instructed. He also provided me two canisters of liquid nitrogen, about a quart in size each, with a spray attachment. They look like miniature fire extinguishers. Ricky also provided me with some water purification tablets, night vision goggles, and a camel pack that could carry up to a gallon of water in it. He also had a really cool dust mask protector that was in the shape of a bandana for the dusty environment I was about to enter. We sat and ate tacos together for about half an hour before I hit the road. I packed the items into my backpack along with a case of nitro bullets and two extra regular canteens of water. In the harsh desert environment, the temperature can reach close to 110 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. Keeping two water canteen surplus was always a wise idea in these situations. Feeling confident that I had everything I needed to get the job done without dying in the desert, I filled up the Bronco and hit the road. The long, monotonous drive to El Paso was uneventful. Miles and miles of scrubby desert and not much else lay between me and my destination. I had an arrangement with the Border Patrol and I had a special spot that I was going to cross, covertly. I didn't want to be noticed very much in this environment, so stealth and the element of surprise was imperative. I wore a desert camo outfit that blended fairly well into the environment as well. I'd reached the coordinates of the gate entry spot, parked the truck, and began preparing for the walk. This walk was to be about four miles through relatively unforgiving terrain during September. It was hot, dry, and dusty. I sipped on water continuously all the while I was walking the distance, because dehydration can take you down in a matter of hours if not prepared. I took the walk during the day because well, I was to reach the destination by nightfall. I popped open my phone and checked how far I was against the coordinates. The coordinates were to an outcropping of old ruined buildings in the middle of the desert, and about 15 minutes away by car, from the town of Juarez. I saw that my destination was, or should have been in view by now, but it wasn't. I began to get that feeling in my gut, that I was close. I possessed a talent of foresight, above and beyond normal people, so I knew my intuitions would be cracked. It was nightfall by now, so I procured my night vision scope headset. I scanned around to see if I could see where the coordinates were leading me to, and then, just barely, I saw it. An outcropping of dilapidated buildings were west of me, about a quarter of a mile away or so. It was three stone structures that were missing blocks from the walls, and were roofless for the most part. My amulet on my chest glowed slightly so I knew I was close. Twenty or so minutes passed as I reached the outer edge of the ruins, and the smell hit me like a freight train. It was the smell of death and decay, 
mixed with the odour of burning sulphur. I had an iron-clad stomach, so to speak, but even this was a bit nauseating for me. I could hear voices echoing from within the ruins as I crept in to get a closer look. What I saw relieved me greatly. The young men that were missing were apparently all here. Well, there was what appeared to be four of the five missing men. I crept up and quickly put my finger out in front of my mouth to silence the four guys that were tied to a pillar in the center of the room. It seemed too easy that they were right out in the open for me to see. I smelled a trap. I took a pebble off of the floor of the ancient room and tossed it toward the four chained men, and it exploded into a mini fireball when it was two feet away from the captured prisoners. Yep, it was a fire circle. A typical trap to lure unsuspecting victims to a fiery death when an escape mission was executed. Oh, shit, I thought to myself. I was going to have to find and vanquish this demon before I could get these guys loose. Where did it go? I whispered. They didn't know, but I knew it was close. I could sense it nearby. I decided to use a tactic that would draw out most demons from their hiding places. These particular demons were not very adept with mental torture. They preferred good old-fashioned brutality over anything else. This made it a bit easier for me to devise a plan to get this SOB and get these guys out of here safe and without further losses. I procured a small leather pouch with a human bone dust in it. Human bone dust was like an attractant in the sense that demons would sense and smell it. I often used this dust to draw out demons from their hiding places. I sprinkled about a quarter of a teaspoon in the entryway to the room that held the four remaining survivors that were imprisoned with the fire column. I set a tripwire line that pulled a small brick down onto the plunger of one of the liquid nitrogen tanks. The tank would spray onto the demon upon entry to the room as long as the demon was in its corporeal form. Zorvids were rarely not in their corporeal form. Don't say a word. I whispered to the guys chained to the pillar. One of the boys was breathing heavily at this point. What's wrong with him? I asked the group. He's diabetic, and his medicine is in our car, at our hotel. One of the young men answered. Keep him calm, and encourage him to try to rest and take deep breaths. This should all be over in about fifteen minutes, I calmly instructed. The events that took place next were the epitome of chaos in the strongest sense of the word. I placed the bone dust near the archway door to the room with the nitrogen tank booby trap ready. I loaded the six nitro shells into my revolver and waited. The trap guys were actually somewhat safe where they were at the moment. I hid behind the door with my revolver in hand and ready to go. I could hear the thunderous grunting sound, followed by heavy footfalls growing closer and closer. The footfalls stopped somewhere outside the door. I then stepped out in front of the doorway, facing the demon. Oh, it was a big one too, standing close to ten feet tall and wearing an obscure set of armor. Its body was extremely muscular, and its head looked like a wild boar. Smoke was hissing from all over the body of the thing. It met my gaze and made a roar that sounded more like a grizzly bear on steroids. It carried a mace made of steel with sharp spikes. It swung the mace in a display of aggression and destroyed the wall to its right, crumbling it to bits. It began to have this hideous gargling laugh as it approached closer. All right, you stupid, nasty, unholy son of a bitch. It's time for you to go back from where you came from, I yelled at it. It smiled deviously, with its face resembling a wild boar crossed with a mythical giant. Now, many demons don't talk much, and these were included in that group. They only roared, groaned, screeched, and wailed. I then watched as the demon hit the tripwire, sending the tilted stone falling on the plunger of the tank. 
The white mist shot out from the canister right into the demon's midsection. It roared in pain and anger as the lower right half of its torso was blackened and dark. It roared a streak of fire at me from its mouth at the same rate of a military flamethrower. I jumped behind a pile of rubble and was just able to escape the flame. I drew my custom 357 revolver with the special nitro shells, took aim and then fired. The bullet hit the demon in the left shoulder, causing it to darken and hiss. Oh, they worked. Those damn bullets work pretty damn well. I made sure to keep something large between the demon and me. I was knocked to the ground as the demon threw a handful of stones and rocks. They collided with the side of my head and sent me to the ground, somewhat dazed. I looked up to see the mace coming down on me. I rolled to the right twice before firing two more bullets into the thing's chest. It roared in anger and was pursuing me and wildly throwing debris around, feverishly trying to get to me. All the while, its blood-red cat's eyes were held firmly gazing into mine as it thrashed around trying to get to me. I was upright now and took aim and fired. A black hiss erupted as one of the demon's eyes and left ear was blackened by the special ammunition. Two bullets left, I thought. I knew I needed to use these wisely, and I needed to get closer. It was clamoring toward me in a limping and irregular pattern. The demon was crippled a bit, but not at all out of the game yet. I drew my revolver once again, and sent the last two bullets into the thing's midsection. It roared, either in pain or anger. Most demons did not feel pain like you or I would. Though. This demon was hobbling around, trying to get in closer to me. And I was now out of bullets. It was time for a bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I reached back with both hands and gripped the twin saws that lay in a custom scabbard made to fit snugly and unobtrusively on my back. The saws made an audible shring as I pulled them out and readied myself. The demon was growling and staring at me with its one good eye left. The thing had an advantage of having substantial reach that was superior to mine. I waited for the demon to take a swing with its mace. When its arm came down, I tilted to the left and rolled out of the way of the mace as it crashed into the stone floor, leaving a crater two feet deep. I waited for his next attack, which came in the form of another swing of its mace. I dashed forward, away from the arc of its swing, and spun 360 degrees with the blades of my swords lashing at the demon's chest, causing black, hissing wounds two feet long into its midsection. It was really pissed off now. But it was injured. I was making progress, but time was running out. The diabetic boy was nearly unconscious now, and I knew he needed medical attention in the next half hour. So I went on the offensive this time, as the demon started to charge me while hobbling and smashing into the walls of the ruins. I slid forward, avoiding its grasp, and plunged my swords into the demon's chest. This seemed to do a great deal of damage, and caused the demon to fall to the ground. I pulled out the swords and went for the head, but was knocked back as the demon grabbed my leg. Its grip was like that of a hot iron, so I brought one of the swords down on the creature's wrist. It didn't cut all the way through, but it did force the demon to release its grip. I now began to have the upper hand. My head was still throbbing, though, from the rubble that had been thrown at me. I had a few cuts on the side of my head that were leaking a lot of blood from them. I must have looked like a demon myself, I thought humorously. Blood coated the left half of my face and was stinging my eyes. The demon began to square off with me while letting out a deep, angry grunt. It was smiling maniacally as if I was a freshly cooked steak about to be eaten. What you got? Come on, come and get me, I taunted the demon. 
I was ready with the remaining tank of liquid nitrogen at my side. It roared like a drooling snarl and began its charge toward me, wielding the gigantic mace. God, if he hits me, it's lights out, I thought as I made my stance. My training took over subconsciously as I breathed deeply as it approached. At this point, it all seemed like slow motion. It began to run toward me, swinging its mace up high, about to crush anything under it with a mighty crash. As the mace came down, I rolled forward, ducking under its swing. I then plunged the swords into the chest of the demon. It again let out a maniacal scream as it began to breathe fire. The flames caught my right arm and singed it with a nasty second-degree burn. Ooh, that's going to leave a mark, it said, as I was wincing in pain, gripping at my arm. The demon stood there with my two swords sticking out of its chest. Its skin was blackening around the swords, and I knew I was about to finish this guy off. I took the other canister of liquid nitrogen and put it on the floor, and then backed away. I wasn't sure if this would work, but it was worth a try. Here goes, I said out loud. I threw a rock and hit the demon in the arm, and it turned toward me. It began to walk forward and was right on top of the canister. I drew my dual Glock 9mm pistols and shot the canister with four or five bullets. The canister erupted sideways and coated only the demon's feet. Oh, shh, I said aloud, as I noticed that it didn't spray up like I'd hoped. Luck was on my side, though, as the demon fell down to the ground in a mighty thud. Its right foot had broken off, causing the demon to fall. I retrieved my sword and plunged them into the eyes. The demon then hissed and exploded in a fine black ash that was disintegrating before my eyes. The firing was eliminated and I freed the guys that were chained up. I called for an ambulance for the diabetic one and then waited for the emergency services to come. Three men entered the room. One of them was a nicely dressed Hispanic male, about 30 years of age, with two huge bodyguards. I called to them. One of these men needs help. Quick. We decide who gets help, homie, the smaller man said with a cocky disposition. Chain whip this fucker, boys, he said with childlike glee. Damn it. Of all the times a gang boss has to show up, it has to be right now. I said, with my head in my hands. Look, guys, just go about your business, and I'll spare your lives, I told the leader while looking into his eyes. Listen to the little bitch try to threaten us, the gang boss said as his henchmen started laughing. Get this asshole, the boss said. I assessed the threat of the two big men with long chains that they were whipping about. The left man took a swing with his chain from side to side which I ducked by dropping to the floor while drawing one of my 9mm pistols. I shot the guy in the foot, dropping him instantly, hearing him yell in pain. The other guy was already attacking with his chain. It connected with my left arm, knocking me to the ground. My energy was getting critically low, and I needed to finish this guy off. I got up and staggered backwards, and procured one throwing knife that was dipped in a toxin that induces sleep within about 30 seconds to a minute. I waited for him to approach, and when he got about 8 feet from me, I threw the knife directly into his center mass, and it hit him in the chest. He yelled and tore the knife out and flung it aside. Good night, sleepyhead, I smiled as he began to stagger, and then fell to the floor motionless. I turned to the boss to see him running away. I started to pursue, but he jumped into a green refurbished Chevy Impala, which then sped away. You messed with the wrong dude, homie, the boss yelled as he pulled off. I had a feeling I was going to see this punk again. I then called EMS to come for the boys that were captured and to come for the two drug cartel thugs as well. 
Later, I pulled into the Motel 6 that was on the edge of town and rented a room for the night. I paid in cash and used the alias Corey Altmeyer. I shaved, showered, and locked up the door. I slept with my custom 357, in the event that there were hostile visitors about to come. After showering, I slept like a log. I woke the next day after about 10 hours of sleep. I donned a blonde wig and put the brown color contact lenses in. I don't need to be dealing with cartel guys right now. No, I had to get back home to San Antonio undetected. I couldn't afford to have anyone tailing me because I was out of ammo and did not want to draw any attention. I drove back and arrived near late evening. I went into my house and plopped down on the couch, only to be irritated by the sight of a hairball that Athena, one of my cats, had coughed up. I smiled and sighed, when all three cats came over to greet me, Puka on my lap, and Chucky and Athena prancing around, playing and wrestling with each other. I smiled again and said, oh, Nice to be home with you guys. I set my alarm for 9am, to play Iron Maiden 666, Number of the Beast. The next day was laundry day, and I was cleaning my equipment and getting my clothes put away. While I was tinkering around the house, I heard my laptop ping. Dark, my deep web contact, who was also a private investigator, said in an email that there's a missing person mission for me. Someone had been abducted by some guys who were really into the black magic scene. Now, there had been some reports of weird sounds and sights happening in the vicinity of Houston, where the woman lived. I started to get my plans together for a three-hour drive to the rough parts of downtown Houston, Texas. I'll get out there in about two days, I told my contact, as I began to get my equipment and disguises ready. There'd be no telling how many enemies I'd have to kill for this one. I chuckled to myself and said, well, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. So another demon's ass well and truly kicked there. Fantastic episode in what I hope is going to be a continuing series here on the channel. Well, exhausted after <laughs> the blood trails on Monday and another half hour story here, but I will of course be delivering you one more tale this week, so join me again on Friday night to see what it is. Until then, I wish you all a fantastic week and sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?